Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Margaret Ziegler. I work with the Global Harvest Initiative, and I'm pleased to, to introduce our panelists. We are going to have a rich discussion this morning about productivity and its importance, and um, we would like to get started. So I'm really glad that Ambassador Quinn and the organizers of, of the World Food Prize have chosen a series of conversations this morning that are focusing on, I think, some not only emerging issues, but they're going to be really critical issues uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, both the post-harvest post uh, waste and loss issue, uh, productivity, uh, improving the productivity of food and nutrition. Uh, these three uh, conversations that we're having this morning, I think, are very cutting edge and are only going to become more important over time. Uh, this morning, um, we are going to look at the critical role that improving productivity plays uh, for food security and nutrition and economic livelihoods. Here to help us understand more deeply those issues are several wonderful uh, experts. First, I'm going to have Jeff Simmons come up, who is the president of Elanco. He's going to be our keynote speaker this morning. Jeff is also the senior vice president and executive officer of Eli Lilly and Company. He's been with Elanco for over two decades in various sales, marketing, and management positions, both in the US and abroad. And many of you have probably heard Jeff speak before. He speaks with great passion and clarity. And I heard him speak at uh, the Chicago Council uh, G8 meeting in, in Washington, DC in May. And uh, he really brought a lot of good perspective and energy to this discussion. We're looking forward to hearing from you, Jeff. Following Jeff, uh, we are going to have a conversation with uh, Jeff and our other panelists. We are today going to introduce Dr. Robert Thompson, who's a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. He's Professor Emeritus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and most recently he held the Gardner Endowed Chair in Agricultural Policy there. He's Senior Fellow of Global Agricultural Development and Food Security at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And Dr. Thompson is no stranger to this topic or the economic factors that are part of addressing our future food needs. He's going to provide a great view on economic implications and trends, and we'll flesh more of this out as we get into our conversation. Next is Susan Finn, President and CEO of the American Council for Fitness and Education. She has a PhD and is a registered dietitian. She's a recognized leader and respected communicator in the field of nutrition and health. Following Susan, we were going to hear a little bit more today uh, from the developing country perspective, uh, Dr. Isidro Maramoros Ochoa, who is a Honduran dairy, beef, cotton, and sugarcane farmer. And he is also a professor at Zamorano University in Honduras, one of the preeminent agriculture schools in the developing world. In addition to managing the farming operations and teaching, he's a consultant for many farming operations throughout Central America in Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Panama, and also in Colombia. He graduated from Zamorano and also attended Mississippi State University where he got his bachelor's in science, his master's in science, and a PhD in animal science, production, and reproductive physiology. He's gonna help us really delve down more deeply into challenges that are faced by farmers in developing countries with achieving greater productivity for food security and livelihoods. So first, I'd like to have Jeff come up, please, and launch us on this discussion with a brief presentation, and then we'll move to our panel. Good morning. It's uh, an honor to be here. And uh, I, I, I'm excited about the discussion that we're about to have. I, I guess I'd start with the, the name behind us and a quote that was mentioned last night uh, and, and why this conference even exists with Norman Borlaug. And the quote that was mentioned last night uh, relative to just uh, really the essence of what this meeting's about, the essence of what that man was about, and the Green Revolution. And just simply the fact that uh, food is a moral right. And all that are born really have the right to food. And that's why we're all here. If there's one common thread, no matter the country, the age, the background, or even the different maybe political or policy positions we have, I think that's common. I'll start with a slide that uh, I've used traveling around uh, over 30 global universities uh, this year, and that is food security. 
to the, to the next generation, food security, creating these four words we're all about, safe, abundant, affordable food, no matter where you are, what you do, I think we all agree that's what this is about. And candidly, that's what Norman Borlaug wanted his legacy to be and probably what he would want us to be talking about today. And I think the essence of productivity is critical. We will live and our kids will live in this generation that last October we passed the 7 billion mark on population. And they say it'll race pretty quickly to 9 billion and then things will likely change and population will level off or there'll be a change. But we will live between the 7 and 9 billion mark. And I would candidly say, as I say in our global pharmaceutical company or in any university with doctors and en energy people and engineers and to say, hold it a minute, this is food security, agriculture, food is the hottest industry the most critical industry, the most critical issue during this window of time. And we are the leaders. And no question, when you come to the World Food Prize, the leaders that sat in that room last night are the leaders that are going to shape, really, what's going to happen between 7 and 9 billion people. That's the essence of it. So in a quick three to four minute, what's our playing field that we have? We've all heard these things. But if I summarize to say, here's what I see as the playing field, and what many of the talks over the last few days have been about is more people live with food as an issue than those that don't. I'll come back to this in a second. Our global population increase. The rising demand. We're going to talk a little bit about something that wasn't talked a lot about so far and also wasn't even talked to, I think, about 20 minutes in the whole G8 Chicago Council was on the animal-based protein touch a little bit about that today. The environmental impact, the economic constraints, and the public issues. Those, I believe, are the six drivers to the playing field that we're on between seven and nine billion people. If I just hit quickly a few slides through them. First, this whole more live without, with, with food is an issue than those that don't. Let me try to put this in context. This came, I lived, last October, I took six 20-year-olds to the largest slum that, that, that I was aware of in Kibera and lived in the slums for, for five days. And it, it took those five days living in the slum to hit this reality that I'm part of. That's the global income distribution of the world that I truly do live in a bubble. And I live on that thin green line because the average, the average income is $7,000 in the world. And I had to go realize that. And then I had a very brilliant man that lived in those slums that led me around for five days say to me something that kind of hung in my heart, and that is 43% of the world, as we all know, lives on $2 a day or less. And then he turned to me as we looked out over the slums, and he said, now hold on a minute, and also one out of four families in the U.S. and Europe are struggling to put food on the table. So forget about the, the, the 1 billion or the 850 million that, that, that are in hunger, unsecure with food. No, more than one out of two people live with food as an issue. If you take the 43% and one out of four, four, four tables that aren't that, you put those numbers together, people that wake up every morning wondering about where and when is my food going to come. I won't starve, but this, this is a big deal, and this is the essence of the world that we, we live in. So that's one reality. The second is just this population increase. We're adding, we're adding about four, four and a half million per month. We're adding a Chicago and an L.A. every month in population. And that's not going to stop here, probably during our working lives here in this, in this room. So that's the population. I say there, there's a lot of people claiming the seventh billion baby that was born on October 31 last year. I don't know. This is one mother that's claiming this is the child. But, uh, but we've, we've got seven billion now, not nearly six billion that I was talking about when we were here a couple of years ago. So the population increases. The other is just this wave of hunger and putting it in the context of really the significance of this. It is the number one health problem in the world. I sit around the table in a pharmaceutical company where there's five presidents. There's an oncology cancer president. There's a diabetes president. There's an Alzheimer's neuro president. And then there's kind of the all other disease. And then there's us. We are in the people business, as I say, and I tell everybody there in our company the last 30 days, we've had two big breakthroughs in Alzheimer's and in breast cancer. And the analysts and all the, the disease people are very excited, and I stop and say, hold it a minute, remember, we're the number one health problem, and oh, by the way, we've already found the medicine. As Norman Borlaug says, we have the solutions. 
all this dialogue that we've been talking about today is connecting the solutions. We've got the answers. It's different than Alzheimer's and cancer, but it's as devastating as those. It kills more than AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, war combined, and as I say, it's about 60 airplanes a day falling from the sky. So that's the clinical side, but there's also what I would say in disease terms, a subclinical side. This is where we get to more live with hunger than those that don't. There's a hidden hunger. That's the getting up every morning, wondering when and where our food is going to come from. In the city I live in, Indianapolis, eight out of ten kids in Indianapolis public schools count on a free lunch and a free breakfast. No, they're not going to starve from hunger. But we have a problem in our city, just as probably Des Moines and others, and that is just this, this longing of knowing and being secure with food around the table or being secure when I go home on the weekend, as many kids in this city will, wondering when and where I will get meals until Monday morning back at school. So that's a little bit of the context. The other one is the other playing field that we don't talk a lot about. This came out of Foreign Policy magazine last year, but there's three billion of the seven billion people, I heard Bill Gates speak on this for the first time, there's three billion people that are on a plant and rice diet that are striving to go across the chasm to eat meat, milk, and eggs for the first time. Over 60% of the demand in emerging markets in this window between seven and nine billion people are gonna strive for, for the first time, meat, milk, and eggs. This is important to understand this, I think, dynamic in our playing field. The environmental impact. Today we're living on about one and a quarter of the world. How do we do this? I think this productivity dialogue here today, we need to touch a little bit on the environmental aspect as well. And then the public, the public affairs issues, which we know are out there, and uh, the politics and the public affairs issues linked to food. So I, I see this as this is our playing field. But I, I, I am coming back to, I think, the realities. So let me just end with an example. And I want to end with an example because I think sometimes we lose a little bit of the context with slides and discussions and the discussion at a high level. And I had somebody, hopefully my, my walking mic here, does this work, is an egg. I had to speak to 40,000 employees in our company that most of them didn't know anything about food and agriculture, but there were scientists all over the world in our company, and I had 10 minutes. And I decided to dig into the story of an egg. Why an egg? There's a lot about an egg. First and foremost, this is the bridge between a plant and a rice diet and maybe what you would call a middle-class diet. This is the longing of mothers all over the world. When I was in Kibera in those slums, you saw mothers saying, if I could get my child just one egg a day. Shoot, the, the table I sat around with mothers in eastern Indianapolis, it was the same thing. What's in an egg? And I think Dr. Finn can explain this a lot better than me. It's the calories, the nutrients, the nutrition to totally change a kid. One a day. That's all we need. And this can change brain development. This can change the nutrition. When the brain development changes, the education changes. When the education changes, a lot of people in this room know better than me, the economics and a community changes. So I'm one of the leaders in Elanco. We are one of the leaders in poultry research. Shoot, I didn't even know until I had to give this talk. And you start to unravel the, the significance of an egg. What's going on in the egg industry right now? Where are we? Well, I'll tell you right now, from this time to a year ago, there are less eggs per person than there were a year ago. We are going backwards in eggs. Let me show you a chart. If you could show the, the chart, the next slide, please. This, this, if you go to the next slide. This is the situation. I'm going to make you egg experts right now. There's six and a half billion hens in the world producing about 174 eggs. But if you look down there in the far left or whatever, we have a negative trend going on. We're losing an egg per hen per day. We're going backwards. So when you put that against the population growth, the six and a half billion egg or six and a half billion hens will need to triple. We'll need to triple if this trend continues. We can't triple. We can't go to 18 billion hens. 
And there's three drivers to this negative trend. One is disease. There, there is a health problem with hens. And as an animal health leader, that's a concern. There's a flu that just hit Mexico, an avian flu. Wiped out 22 million birds. There's an egg shortage. Mexico City, in less than a year, eggs are up three times the cost. Second is just the lack of innovation. There's companies like us not focused and targeted on innovation in the ag industry. Candidly, this wasn't one of the big proteins that we were focusing on, like dairy and beef and poultry. And the third is animal welfare. There's policies and approaches on how to raise birds that maybe came from a minority voice that actually have flipped productivity upside down and actually increased disease. California would be an example of that as eggs are up over 20%. Egg production is down because of a proposition that was put on a ballot a few years ago. Those three drivers have flipped this thing upside down. And really, the choice then, if, you've, if you hit the, the tab, please, we really have a choice of, are we headed to 11 billion more hens? Are we headed to, if you hit it again, please, 4 billion more? As a leader in poultry research, we must change this trend. But I come back to more the moral aspect of this. I come back to thinking about Sarah, a young teenage daughter that is sitting with her mother saying, we just want to be able to provide our, my younger brother and sister with more food here in Indianapolis or in, 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 in Kibera, the slums in Kenya, one more egg a day can make all the difference in the world and can change a cycle. This is more of a realistic, I think, practical example of what we're faced with between seven and nine billion people. And it's going to be us, the leaders in this room, that change that trend. So that shapes, hopefully, a little context for our, our discussion around what I believe is ultimately a slide, the last slide here I have, is these three numbers I shared back uh, three years ago when I spoke here. It's this simple. And by 2050, we need 100% more food. 70% of that or more has to come from technology. Technology is just doing things better, like the last discussion up here about coal pack to a better farm practice, to genetics, to a product that may change a trend on an egg productivity level. 70% is around productivity, and that's really the essence, I think, of this dialogue right now over the next 45 minutes is what, what, what entails in that 70%. It's a moral imperative as much as an economic and environmental imperative. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's, let's dive into this issue of productivity and, and protein and demand and, and nutrition. And um, Bob Thompson, I just want to kind of transition to you a bit now. We, we remember that uh, about 20 years ago, I think it was 1999, uh, Chris Delgado and Mark Rosegrant at IFPRI wrote a wonderful uh, um, paper on, on the coming livestock revolution. And, and can you talk more about the trends um, for animal protein and demand globally and, and give us a bit more of a context. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks, Jeff, for that wonderful stage setting for this session. Um, when, we, when we look at demand, as Jeff indicated, we've, we've got to feed something close to the equivalent of two more Chinas in the next 40 years. I think that helps and put in perspective the magnitude of the challenge just in terms of feeding numbers of people. But we've also been in a period of rapid urbanization, with half of the world's population living in cities today projected to go to 70% by 2050. We know urbanization changes dietary patterns, usually includes more animal protein in the diet. And then we've also just come off a period of record rates of poverty reduction over the last 25 years or so uh, in East Asia. But we see economic growth rates accelerating in South Asia and in India and in Sub-Saharan Africa. We've got 17 countries that have averaged over 6% economic growth per year for the last decade. And we've got 20 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa going to, going to achieve 6% uh, economic growth this year, uh, despite the global economic slowdown. So the first thing that people do when they have additional purchasing power, low-income people do when they have purchasing power, is buy enough calories, solve the basic hunger problem. Because in the end, except in times of uh, 
natural disasters or politically imposed famine, uh, most hunger ultimately is associated with the inability to access enough food because they simply lack purchasing power. So when we, as people first solve the hunger problem, then they have the purchasing power as incomes continue to rise to include animal protein, some eggs, milk, meat, as well as fruits, vegetables, and ed inedible oils. But uh, so to the extent that we solve the poverty problem, get incomes rising, uh, we, we make that important accomplishment of reducing hunger, but then we unleash the period of most rapid increase in demand for agricultural products as incomes rise from one to two up to about $10 or so per day. So that's the, that's the, that's the great challenge as well as opportunity. But as we, as we see demand for food increasing by 70 to 80%, and including in particular more animal protein in the diet, uh, this means that we've got to figure out how are, we going to, how are we going to produce it. If we fail to increase supply as fast as demand, it's going to put upward pressure on prices. We know the poor spend the largest fraction of their incomes on food, and you'll increase the incidence of hunger as a result of the failure to expand supply as fast as demand is growing. Okay, so what's the potential? for expanding supply? Well, first, we know that there's at most 10% more land worldwide that isn't presently forested, subject to erosion and desertification. So if we need to increase production 70 to 80% or even doubling uh, to satisfy the growing demand for food in the world, that, uh, and we've only got 10% more land, the only sustainable future is to increase the productivity of that land that's in production. Failure to do that would involve Massive destruction of forests, we lose forests, we lose wildlife habitat, we lose biodiversity, reduce carbon sequestration capacity, accelerating global warming, certainly unacceptable environmental outcomes. So the only sustainable future is one in which we raise productivity in agriculture. First in the land, certainly also in water. Farmers use 70% of the fresh water used in the world today. If the urban population goes to 70% by 2050, there is no way the world's farmers are going to have access to 70% of the fresh water. So whatever increase in production it's going to take, we're going to have to uh, significantly increase productivity of the water. So if we need to double the average productivity of the land, we may need to triple the crop per drop. And I think it's extremely appropriate that Professor Hillel uh, was acknowledged this, at this event for his major contribution to increasing the efficiency of water use in global agriculture. But it's not only in, animal, or in plant agriculture, as Jeff indicated, where we need to raise productivity. I took feeds and feeding at Cornell, the basic animals, uh, animal nutrition course, 50 years ago. The rate of conversion that we learned of how much grain it takes to produce a pound of pork 50 years ago is double what it takes today. We've made major productivity growth uh, or we've had major productivity growth in animal agriculture. In dairy farming, we're producing almost five times as much milk per cow as we did at the end of World War II, and with 80% less feed. We've had immense productivity growth. But as Jeff indicated, we've got to keep raising, the, raising productivity in animal agriculture as well as in plant agriculture if we're going to feed the world's larger population better than today at reasonable cost without destroying the environment. But one other point I want to hit bef uh, while I have the microphone. It's not only re increasing pr uh, productivity that has to be addressed with urgency, it's also reducing the barriers to international agricultural trade. East and South Asia have twice as much of the world's population than of the arable land, and virtually all the arable land there is already in production. There is no scenario I can construe in which with population, income growth, and urbanization in East and South Asia that they're not going to need more imports from the world market to provide part of their national food security. Middle East and North Africa, of course, lack water along with a number of other dry areas and areas that are getting drier. So when we recognize the mismatch between where the land in the world and the water, fresh water supplies are in the world with where the population is, we're going to have to have a larger fraction of the world's food production moving through international markets. It's neither economically efficient nor environmentally sustainable. 
to try and be self-sufficient in all food products in every region of the world when you have such a huge mismatch between natural resource base and where the people are. So we need to reduce the barriers to international trade. Uh, we saw in 2008 when, we, when a number of countries slammed on the brakes on allowing agricultural exports to occur, this contributed significantly to the overshooting of commodity prices that occurred in, uh, in the summer of 2008. So we need to raise productivity, reduce the barriers to international trade, and both of them with urgency. Great. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, just <laughs> We have an enthusiastic audience. This is great. Susan, I want to turn to you next. Um, you know, we, we talk about macro level issues, trade level issues, but what is the impact of increasing productivity, particularly with respect to protein, uh, on, on nutritional outcomes for, for women, children, vulnerable populations? Well, first of all, thank you, Margaret, uh, for putting the nutrition perspective in this discussion and uh, the role that r registered dietitians play in this. There's a lot of us in this country all over the world, and we're very eager to participate in this kind of a conversation. I started my career in Cleveland, Ohio, working in the inner city, counseling young teenage pregnant women. And that was the late 60s, early 70s, and see, even way back then, we knew the importance of prenatal nutrition to the health of the mother, to the health of the child, and the health of the community. We have known this for a long time. I then went and spent the majority of my career in industry uh, and worked with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And I, I, it is with that background that I want to share a couple of points that I think are really important for the discussion regarding nutrition. Number one, we know this is a huge, huge global issue, and it's solvable as many, I'm sure, of your speakers have uh, presented and as Jeff presented. The key is that nutritionists know there are two key periods of life when we need to focus our efforts. One is in pregnancy and one is in children one to five. And the reason about pregnancy is nutrition begins right then. It begins in the womb and every expert in the field of medicine agrees with the fact that that is where it, we have to lay a good foundation something like 17 million stillbirth children born uh, of mothers that simply have inadequate nutrition. And that sets up the whole cascade of illnesses that occur over those years. Uh, mental retardation, physical ailments, uh, inability to respond to diseases that normally children would recover for. Huge problem. When you go to children, one to five, when breastfeeding stops, children are then put on the diet of the culture, the community, and that's where the first thing we see is stunted growth. And while that is an indirect measure of, of nutritional status, it clearly is a measure that that child is undernourished and not getting enough. And what happens is, of course, we see then that cascade of stunted growth, poor muscle development, poor motor development, and cognition. And I was uh, saying this morning to Jeff, there's a really a very interesting study that I recall from my many years uh, working in industry uh, regarding infant nutrition. And it was a work that a, a well-known pediatrician uh, individual that studied the brain and metabolism of the brain. And he says, you know, the brain grows of a child, brain grows on a once-only basis. It grows in utero, and it grows for the first two years of life. And the nutrients that are needed are needed right then when that process of that brain is developing. You can't catch up. You have to have it then. And that's why nutritionist dietitians really do recommend and urge everybody to focus on that population. That's why we see programs develop to that. So clearly we've got a problem. I know you have probably dissected the FAO report of that 870 million undernourished people around the world, primarily in developing countries. Uh, and whether one could argue whether that figure is correct or not, we would agree that it is unacceptably high and we need to do something about it. We need to do it now. So that's point number one. Point number two is that I think we know, and I just came back from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics meeting, and by the way, our current incoming president's sitting about four rows down. So if you've got any questions, you can ask her. Uh, but I just came back from that meeting. We had 10,000 dietitians there. And there's two things I noticed. On the agenda and the program this year, for the very first time, there was a large number of sessions devoted to world hunger. 
it's an issue and it's rising and our members know that. Secondly, the number one when I sat in those sessions, over and over again it was said, yeah, we got to feed calories, but it's got to be more than calories. Just calories aren't enough. It's the quality of those calories that are so important. It's the value of a high quality diet. We tend to talk about nutrient density. Jeff's example of the egg is a perfect example of a nutrient dense food. Six grams of protein in one egg. That's half the requirements of a child here in the United States. That's half the protein requirements. Iron, very high in iron. High in choline, which is needed for nerve development. Uh, high in xanthine and, and lutein necessary for eyes. And we could go on and on, and many nutrients we don't even know what they do that are contained in, a, in, in one egg. We need high quality proteins. Now our conversation over the years has kind of shifted. It's clearly calories in the United States we talk about now, over calories, over consumption of calories. But clearly our, our conversations in the scientific community wane between protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Right now, we've kind of shortchanged our protein. And we need to get back and talk about it. And it's, it is about animal protein and choices, uh, at least for animal protein. Why animal protein? Well, we, we learn in basic chemistry, it's got amino acids, which are necessary for all of our bodies to function, all of our cells to function, including our brains. It's got nine of those essential amino acids that our body can't make. It's absolutely important for cell growth and for muscle and motor development. But because it's nutrient dense, it contains other things that are come along with it that are extremely important to health. It contains zinc. Zinc is found in meat. It is needed for immunity. It is needed for growth. If you open up the basic textbook of any nutrition textbook, it'll show oftentimes what happens in zinc deficiency. You can take twins that have been reared differently and fed different diets, and you'll find if it's zinc deficient, uh, that child does not have meet their growth potential. Zinc, very important, found in animal-based foods. Iron, absorbable form of iron. You know, just because it has iron in it, it doesn't mean it gets into the body and it's useful. We need a heme source of iron, and that's found in animal protein as well, uh, particularly egg yolk, particularly lean meats. Uh, we also need vitamin A. Vitamin A, blindness, 130 million children uh, with uh, various vision deficiencies because of lack of vitamin A. We need vitamin A, and there are many, many sources to get it. We all think of probably carrots, and clearly uh, yellow, particularly strong orange uh, vegetables and, and plant-based foods have high vitamin A, but so does dairy, and how important it is as well to get along with that particular food group. Uh, B12, most of us don't worry about B12 because we kind of make it in our colon, but we also need uh, B12 if in fact your diet's really inadequate, and that comes along with meat and milk. So there's a lot of things that come together in animal protein foods that are important, and we need to focus on uh, certainly on more protein in the diet. Yes, clearly combining various plant bases is also an option, but it ought to be a choice that's available for people. Point number three, we talk about a balanced diet. And uh, no doubt, we need to think about all of those components together. And we know that the complexities that you all deal with in the worlds that you work in are complicated. And it's not just as easy as uh, putting an egg on a table or making a meal uh, with high protein. We know that there are complications. And it takes planning. It takes all technology and all the things that you are concerned about at this conference. But sometimes, sometimes really simple things Little things can make a big difference. And I would cite for you a study that's uh, probably the most quoted in the literature. It was a study done in Kenya of children uh, that received supplements. They were studying the effect of supplements. And they took 500 and some Kenyan children and they fed them, a con there was a control group, control diet. There was a group with a supplement added that was a corn and bean-based supplement. Then we had a group with that same supplement, only milk included, and then a supplement with meat. And it was a very interesting finding, just a supplement, five days a week. What they found over a two-year period was the children grew. They gained weight, no doubt about that, regardless of the supplement they were on. Those small things made a difference. But the group that got the meat and the milk 
gained something else more important, and that was their muscle. They amid our muscle circumference, which is an indirect measure of muscle. They were laying down muscle because it was a high quality protein. How important it is we provide those kinds of, of, of ingredients and food choices. The other thing is we saw B12. B12 inadequacy went away in the meat and the milk group. And of course, cognition approved and cognition approved uh, with the beef group. So what's all this say to you? It says to me, that small things, something as small as that, is doable, it's preventable, and it sets children on the right course of action. And it begins to break that cycle that we see of undernourished, underfed, and poorly nourished children. We need to think about breaking that cycle. We need to think about those simple things that we can do to make a real difference in the health of the individual, and the health of a community, and certainly the health of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Mm. Susan, your, your story there reminds me a bit about uh, just about two and a half years ago I was in Guatemala uh, speaking with a uh, country director of a major non-governmental organization and it just sparked my memory of as he was telling us about the, the struggle with stunting in Guatemala uh, and the global problem of stunting is, is immense. But he shared with me the, the frustration he had with how can we get even a cup of milk a day an egg a day, a cup of milk a day to a child, and, and, and the impact that would have. And, and it is widely recognized that these simple interventions, simple lifestyle changes will really make a dramatic difference. It's so doable. it is. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to Isidro from Honduras. And before actually we get into kind of your presentation, I'd like you to just share a bit more with the audience. Um, talk about the nature of what you're doing. Um, you're, you're much you have a, a much larger operation. You're not what anyone would consider a smallholder farmer. You have uh, a number of operations that you focus on for productivity, uh, different sectors of, of crop and livestock production. Can you tell us more? Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I, the last 22 years I work at Samorano, Pan American School of Agriculture, and they encourage us uh, professors there to be involved with the industry. And in that sense, I've been a consultant for different farmers, especially beef cattle farmers, uh, dairy farmers, and all the, the feed crops that uh, support that industry or those industries. Um, in, at the farm level, we work with dairy. Uh, we, we are milking 400 cows. Uh, we are milking, uh, I mean, uh, we are growing uh, close to 500 steers. Uh, we're doing sugar cane as a main feed crop for them. and. Uh, uh, we're doing also maize, uh, production of maize in large operation for, for food and for feed. And we're also doing coffee. Uh, we, we, we have about uh, 100 acres right now of coffee and we're growing in that uh, because of the opportunities. Very important group right there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, why don't you talk a bit more uh, from your perspective in Central America, uh, Honduras and, and many countries in Central America, um, we'd like to hear a little bit more about perhaps the livelihoods aspect of productivity, the impact that this can have, particularly for women farmers, um, as, as they can increase productivity of whatever it is they're growing, crops, livestock, uh, hens. Uh, how, what's the importance of that for women and the health and nutrition of their families and their livelihoods? In, in Latin America, um, is, is we don't see as much participation of, of women as, as we, or, or as I experience here in the, in the dialogues in Africa, for example. But anyway, uh, the women that are involved in the animal industry, uh, it doesn't matter if they're producing eggs or they're producing uh, milk, uh, it provides a cash flow for them. It provides an opportunity for them to get involved into an industry that uh, it has a good cash flow, a daily cash flow. And, and that enables them and empowers them uh, to feed their families, to, to, to become active in their, in their, uh, in their economies and community economies. It, 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 it's known that when, when you move one dollar in, in the milk industry, you're usually moving anywhere from two to three dollars in other services uh, and in other industries that are related to the community. So if women can get involved in, in such a, um, uh, operations, uh, they, they have a, a greater opportunity than just food crops. 
uh, just as, as they get involved in, in, in high cash crops also. Uh, if they can get involved in, in, in an industry like milk production or egg production where there is a cash flow, then they will have better opportunities. Great, great. Well, why don't you share a bit more um, with some of the practices in the region that you see that are uh, contributing to productivity from your experience in Central America? Um, what are some of the promising innovations, whether it's on the science side, whether it's on uh, management practices, feed practices, marketing practices? What are, what are some of the ways that productivity is really helping farmers in Central America? I just want to start by, by referring to a small study um, us farmers, when, when we have been asked to, to produce more, to produce 100 tons of a, of a certain food, uh, usually in the past, and, and right now, we are delivering 110, 120. Uh, and that's a sense to the tools such as uh, Dr. Norman Burlos put with us hybrids and, and all sorts of biotechnology. Uh, the story that I have to share with you from Honduras we were hit with Hurricane Mitch uh, 14 years ago, uh, almost to the day, because it was uh, October 31st. And uh, the quickest industry that responded and was able to put uh, a, a, an economic, economic flow in the communities was the dairy industry. Uh, we then, uh, uh, together with USAID and, and Lano Lakes, we put together a program where we developed 40 milking, uh, milk, uh, milk collection and, and cooling centers in order for them to get access to a better market. Uh, the baseline, the production baseline was 23 producers for each center and it was 1,000 liters, 1,100 liters of milk uh, for, for all of them. That's an average of not even 50, uh, or around 50 liters per, per producer. Uh, we scaled down on the facilities that they have. And now, 14 years past, they're producing the, the, the least amount is 8,000 liters. Uh, some of them are producing 12,000 liters. So if given the opportunity, if given producers, if given the opportunity, they will deliver more food uh, and more uh, economic growth uh, for their communities. If given the proper uh, opportunities. Uh, we came together with uh, best management practices, with uh, pasture-based production uh, management practices. We came together with uh, better health practices and uh, with um, feeding, feeding uh, programs. And the, as a the result of that, we, we didn't think that they will grow to, to 5,000 liters, you know, because we, we, we built the centers for them to handle 5,000 liters. Mm -hmm. And they are handling now, they, they were, most of them have, are having to rebuild their centers because they are de delivering 8,000, uh, 9,000, 12,000 liters, okay? So in, in that sense, for, for us to be more productive, uh, in the next 30 years, uh, the GAP report says that Latin America will be an next exporter of food, uh, and then what we need is the opportunities to, 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 to be able to produce that. However, as, as opposed to the last 30 years, uh, we now have social constraints, we have water constraints, we have a higher feed costs, we have a bunch of, uh, a lot of um, uh, biotic uh, things against us. And we need biotechnology, we need the, 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 the opportunities that biotechnology has, uh, and if you can put a slide that I have, uh, I am using, for example, uh, I need, in order to produce more milk, we need better pregnancy rates in our cows, okay? And we are, through technology, through the, the hormone schemes to handle estrous cycle, we are able to get 80 better percent of, of, uh, of pregnancy rates. We are using the genetics, both from Brazil, uh, uh, milking gear, and, both, and from the United States or, 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 or New Zealand, uh, in, with the Jersey technology, with the Jersey breeds and the, and the Holland uh, uh, um, Freshen or Holstein breeds, and we are putting together a crossbreed cow that is able to produce much better under our tropical conditions. Uh, we need the vaccines. We need a lot of things that are provided uh, in the animal health industry, uh, just like Jeff mentioned, 
uh, that enabled us to produce 10, 15, 20% more milk or more beef. And uh, we also, where the biggest impact uh, that the bio, biotechnology has is in the animal feed and nutrition industry. Uh, we need uh, the enzymes, we need the prebiotics, we need the uh, probiotics uh, in order to, for us to achieve greater standards of production, greater effectiveness of production, greater conversion rates, and to be more, uh, to deliver better, better uh, milk or, 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 or beef or whatever we are producing. Uh, I think biotechnology has a role and it's played a role already, but we cannot be denied of the opportunities uh, that biotechnology has to offer, and we cannot just ignore those opportunities that biotechnology has to offer in order to become more effective and to get that 70% that Jeff mentioned out of uh, that 70% extra production needs to come out of a better, not only better management, but also biotechnology. Thank you. And just a follow-up question. I wanted to ask, um, I'm curious about how you see, Isidro, this interaction between in increased productivity and the potential for um, improved sustainability on the environment, uh, protection of resources. What's the interaction there? Um, well, in order to have access for us, we, we are, even in national markets, we are now having to be certified. Uh, and all these certification processes, uh, one, of the, one of the things they are looking, uh, uh, you know, us for is uh, for environmental issues. We need to be able to produce in an environmentally responsible manner. We need to be pr producing in a socially responsible manner. We were not asked uh, for a long time that, even though uh, I think farmers were doing as much as possible, as, they, as much as they could, but now we, in order to get access to market, nationally or internationally, it doesn't matter if it is a staple food, uh, like milk, for example, the companies that buy, buy our milk are asking us to be environmentally responsible. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're producing staple food for rice or, or corn, they have certain standards and we need to comply with that. And if in the international market is, is even, we, we are uh, not with the burden, but we have to comply with a lot of laws, with a lot of biohazards, with a lot of things in order to get access to European markets, to, uh, to, to United States markets, or to Middle East markets. We are sending beef to, to Middle East markets now. And we have to comply with a lot of certification processes that are needed and that we are looking at after. Great, excellent examples. Thank you. Uh, I wanted it also just to touch a bit on um, perhaps um, bringing things back around to you, Jeff. I know that you, you talk a lot and that the theme of this whole week has been partnerships. What are some effective partnerships that you can share that you've seen from, from your work at Alanco um, with either developing country governments, with, with uh, other partners, civil society organizations, uh, can you share a little bit more about the, this theme of partnerships and what you see as successful models? Yeah, I, I think if you, it is absolutely critical that we really understand the facts and give every country the opportunity to, you know, capitalize on the opportunity. So I, I say we're here in America, it's a good place to start to say, you know, back to the, the earlier question, in the last 55 years, we have increased food 250% on the same carbon footprint. When anyone ever asks me, give me a great technology, I say, I could go to Brazil, I could go even to Europe, let's start American agriculture. 250%, same carbon footprint, give me any industry that could touch that. Now the challenge is we've got to do it again. And we not just do it again here, we've got to do it again in Kenya, and we've got to do it in, 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 in southern China. And so to me, I think, one, it's, it's globalizing technology. It's, it's companies and countries like ourselves and other being able to take plants, animal, many technologies, cold storage, and get in there and understand the importance of it. Technology can't be disconnected with bad with food. It is the answer to every other industry. It's the answer to the, this industry. 
We've never raised it more efficiently. It's never been more safe than it is. And bring on the food standards, raise them. Because I believe, looking at the pipelines of technology today, just as Norman Borlaug said, we've got enough technology in our pipelines and enough technology around the world to feed 10 billion people. But it's globalizing it, it's taking it local, and I think it's trade standards. I think trade standards is another way we must collaborate. The FAO, the codex type organizations that say, look, every country can decide whether or not what they want to accept. But allow the 200 and some countries that are involved in that to be able to say, OK, thank you for that standard, that residue standard. Or now I know it's safe. Or that animal practice is the ideal practice. I think knowing that allows there to be less politics. There allows to at least be a level playing field and allows countries, companies, the private, the public, and the social, that kind of triangle, to be able to go in there locally and say, OK, now let's talk about it. I was in a country in Latin America last week, and they defined a gap. This, I think, is the future of food. And they said, by 2020, here's our gap. And then they split it up by the proteins they want mm -hmm. and the different segments, how much grain gap, how much beef gap, how much. And then they had companies like us and other organizations sitting at the table saying, what can you do to fill that gap? That's the future. And, and we can do this, as Norman Borlaug said, we can do this. It's just having that, allowing to have that dialogue and not allowing some minority vo voice with a different objective to blurry what is the important part of this vision. Thank you, Jeff. I think we have about two to three minutes here for a few questions before we wrap up. Uh, so if, I, if I, anyone in the audience has two questions to have a little bit of interaction with our panel, uh, there is a, I believe there's a microphone in the center aisle. Uh, Sorry, this microphone wasn't set up for the stunted demographic in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> if you could say, uh, your, say your name. Yes, and I'm Nabi Hakazi with Humanitas Global in Washington, D.C. Thank you for this fantastic panel and, and for this information. Um, I think you know it's loud and clear that we really need to leverage uh, innovation and resources to meet growing global food demands. Um, and I think we all know and something to recognize that just because we meet global food demands does not necessarily mean that we're also going to meet global nutrition demands. Uh, that's an opportunity and a challenge for us, and I think we have to be quite deliberate to address both. So my question for you, I'm putting my public health hat on, and I'm also asking the question, recognizing that despite raising incomes and, and economic status in emerging uh, countries, we still may be short on dietary diversity, we still uh, may have issues because there isn't rampant fortification, for example. So my question is, what's currently underway and what is the untapped potential to, to improve uh, the nutritional profile and value of animal sourced outputs? So how do, we, how do we really get that nutrition bang for our buck um, out of that one egg or that piece of meat? Um, I'd love to hear your comments. You want to start and then I'll... <laughs> well, obviously, uh, Nabiha is you've got to get those foods to these people. I mean, clearly, animal source proteins are the best sources for many of the micronutrients that are missing in the diets of, of children and pregnant women and others in, in poverty-stricken areas. We have to do a better job of including those protein foods. And as I said, I think what we've done is we've focused, particularly in the United States, on calories not on uh, uh, protein. We focused on fat, not on protein. It's, it's about getting all of those things. And if you really look at the protein needs of an individual, they're about 10 to 15% of those calories, maybe a little higher depending on the individual. But so, so it's relatively a small amount of the total calories that mean to be focused on, on, protein, on protein foods, particularly animal protein foods. Technology. Anyway. Technology is a huge part of this, and of course, this is what this whole debate is about GMOs and other initiatives, is, is really improving the existing qualities of those foods so that they meet the specific needs of, uh, of that population. Yeah, I mean, and I know we've got another question here, but you know, we're seeing this in, in, in the cross space with biofortification. Um, right. and, and we know that we're just scratching the surface with improving right. omega-3 profile right. of eggs. So what else could we be doing? What's not, what's not happening that's on the horizon? Thank you. Bob, Bob wants to say something. Uh, I'd just like to add one point uh, related to this, not, uh, not from the technology side, but from the public policy side. 
in most countries of the world which have uh, price supports for agricultural commodities, we're supporting the prices of staples. We're, n we're not doing anything to encourage the production of nutrient-dense foods, fruits, vegetables, even uh, animal, pr uh, animal protein other than milk, uh, which is, tends to be supported in many countries. And we could, we could do a better job of providing the right signals to farmers to produce those nutrient-dense crops in uh, countries throughout the developing world as well as in the high-income countries. And then I think, you know, farmers respond to price incentives inclusive of public policy, and I think that would help address the issue you raise as well. So we need both public policy and technology. And education. And education, of course. Okay, one more question. We have time. I'm Mary from uh, Kenya. Uh, Borog Lip Ferro and an award Ferro. And uh, I want to contribute uh, by talking about something towards uh, our future thoughts in respect to food and nutrition security. And I'm looking at the situation of cooking energy. And uh, looking at the situations in our developing countries, poor households spend a lot of money on cooking energy. And if the trend continues, and we are able to increase uh, production. We might end up in a situation where we have uh, poor households having food, but then going hungry because they cannot be able to cook the food. And uh, looking at the situation in our developing countries, for example, in Kenya, if you are living on a dollar per day, and then you have to use all this money on purchasing uh, energy, then the uh, energy Excuse me. poverty. I'm sorry. Is, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you just ask the, ask the question, please? Because we're we don't want to take time away from the next panel. Yes, that's okay. What I'm saying Thank is you. that we need to include energy in the debate because we need to look at energy poverty. Is not only going to cause people to be hungry, but they're also going to be depressed. They have food that they cannot cook. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's a great point. And if any of you want to, do you want to address quickly her, her issue? Any one of you? Well, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, we have terribly inefficient cooking technologies in the food preparation place in homes throughout the developing world. There's a lot that can be gained by increasing the efficiency of the use of the energy that we do use. Uh, also, probably the greatest cost, though, is not an inability to cook. It's the amount of time that young girls spend fetching fuel wood and other fuels for that cooking function. And as a result, they end up not being in school, but rather spend their days fetching fuel wood as well as fire, or as well as water. Thank you. I'm going to ask Jeff uh, now to just make some closing remarks for us before we, we close this panel. So, Jeff, uh, final thoughts. And, and thank you, all, all of the panelists, for your input. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get to that, okay, in my closing comments here. Are those free-range eggs? No, they're not free-range eggs, okay. You know, I'll, I'll conclude by saying thank you to this panel. Um, it's an honor to sit here with uh, um, such a diverse and such an experienced panel, and um, thank you, Margaret, for leading us in this discussion. I guess I would conclude by just saying um, a couple things. I think we link back a lot to these three things. Um, this safe, abundant, affordable food and food security, you know, through my lens of listening and a lot of talks and a lot of dialogue, like all of you, uh, innovation or technology, whatever you call it, we've got to do it better. We've got, to, we've got to do it better. Two is choice. Choice is important. Maybe it links to the free-range eggs. Is we've, we need to let everybody choose. There's vegetarians in this audience that have heard about animal-based protein, and I've got a vegetarian that runs all of our manufacturing and half our employees. I believe in choice. We all should believe in choice, whether it's at a country level or a consumer level or that's a teenage daughter level. <laughs> choice, choice matters. I have two of them. It's my biggest leadership <laughs> challenge right now is my two teenage daughters. <laughs> choice matters. But when choice becomes, your choice and your beliefs are so strong that suddenly you no longer have a regulator. You have a minority voice that suddenly becomes the new regulator, we have a problem. Then we start to get what Norman Borlaug says is immoral and wrong. 
And third, I think, is trade, is globalization. We need to take technology globally. We need to execute it on the ground better, whether that's cooking technology or whether that's a new product or a new practice. We need to let meat, milk, eggs, grains move around the world. That's the only way to fully solve between seven and nine billion people. But I end with this. I ask all of you, I never ever end an audience, I'm sorry, but I'll come back to maybe this. I don't want you to look at an egg differently. What I ask every single employee in my company is every single quarter, every month if you can, we give them a half a day. Go out and see a hungry face. Because when that happens, I believe what I said at the G8 is the hunger inside of us. I don't care if you're a politician, a farmer, a dietitian, wherever you stand on these issues, we got to get out of our bubble because most of us live in a bubble. The hunger inside of us wanting to become a part of something bigger is the solution to the physical hunger that this thing is all about. That's what Norman Borlaug had that I believe we need. And when that happens, things change. I've seen things change. I've lost control of my company. Because when people see this, it's suddenly it's about a cause. And this is truly what our cause is. I've been just, I'm in the middle of a month-long hunger challenge. And I got my six kids, myself, my wife, eating rice and beans like half the world all week. And uh, I'm going to interview them. If you want to follow me on Twitter, we're gonna, I'm going to interview them, okay, tonight. And they aren't very happy about the rice and beans, okay? <laughs> What they don't realize is week number two, we're going on a food stamp budget. We're all living on $4.18 a day. My challenge is when we get outside of our bubble, things change. Don't lead the World Food Prize 2012 without getting out of your bubble. Because I'm telling you, with the intellect in this room, we light our fire more like Norman Borlaug, things will change. And we will unfold this egg story over the next few months. If you, want to, if you want to follow along in social media, we're going to tell more and more about this because I think it takes these kind of examples. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, what you do. Thanks.